Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Now we're going to return to our reading and discussion of the book Rulers of Evil by F. Tupper Saucy, Chapter 18 of the book, entitled The Stimulating Effects of Tea. And we're talking about the fomentation of, uh, of the Revolutionary War. And I'm going to back up a couple paragraphs for continuity purposes. He says, during the night of December 16, 1773, a gang of Indians climbed aboard certain ships in Boston Harbor, ripped open 342 of the East India Company's tea chests, and, over, and threw overboard their contents valued at $90,000. Well, they looked like Indians, and witnesses thought they were Indians. But the big open secret was that they were Freemasons in disguise. Now remember, Jesuitism went underground at their suppression in 1773. The assertion of this author is that they they found refuge in uh, Adam Weishaupt's Illuminati and then resurfaced in this country in Freemasonry to help foment the Revolutionary War to separate the colonies, the Protestant colonies, from Protestant Great Britain, and then to establish a government that demand that established firmly religious liberty in this country, so that Catholicism could flourish. Remembering that Catholicism was suppressed in Great Britain, and while the Protestants came to this country seeking relief from the Inquisition and per- religious persecution, the Catholics who came to this country came in relief. Uh, searching relief from their uh, suppression in Great Britain. And so now there becomes a battle. Who is going to control the country? And on the basis of religious liberty, the Catholics uh, factored large in that Revolutionary War and the Declaration of Independence and the formation of our Constitution guaranteeing religious liberty. And uh, they literally set up a constitution where, whereby Catholicism could flourish and eventually take control of government. That's the thesis. Now, the Freemason, disguised as Indians, broke into the, to the East India Company's tea chests and threw overboard $90,000 worth of tea. And he says, perhaps the most succinct statement on the subject appears in in respected Masonic historian Arthur Edward Waite's new encyclopedia of Freemasonry, quote, the Boston Tea Party was entirely Masonic, carried out by members of the St. John's Lodge during the adjourned meeting, during an adjourned meeting. And it says Parliament reacted to the Boston Tea Party, talking about the the British Parliament, reacted to the Boston Tea Party in a way calculated to increase dozens of rolling boulders into a devastating landslide. In other words, it precipitated a response from Parliament. And these responses, as this author asserts, were the boulders that... that, that, uh, Lorenzo Ritchie, the Jesuit general, had precariously perched to fall at his command, thus exacerbating the 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 the, uh, animosities between the colonies and England to foment the Revolutionary War. And he says, without seriously inquiring into who is responsible, and wholly disregarded the offer of more than a hundred Boston merchants to make restitution. Parliament rushed into law a mass of unreasonably punitive legislation, closing the port of Boston to trade, forbidding town meetings without the consent of the governor, denying the Massachusetts legislature the right to choose the governor's council, providing for the quartering of British and Hessian troops in the colony, and ordering that any officer or soldier of the crown accused of an act of violence in the performance of his duty should be sent to another colony or to England for what would surely be a sweetheart trial. To complete the overkill, guaranteeing a revolution, if they used overkill, it says Parliament passed the Quebec Act, 
which cut off the claims of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia, and New York to their western lands and placed these lands to add insult to injury under the French Catholic jurisdiction of Quebec. It was a huge giveaway of, of colonial land to Catholic control. Now, you, you, you know how that would uh, anger Protestant colonials, colonists. And he says, so exaggerated out of proportion uh, to the offense they were framed to punish, these notorious quote-unquote intolerable acts by the British Parliament caused every class of American to sympathize with the Tea Partiers. Suddenly, independence was no longer a radical alternative. The intolerables rendered independence the subject of sensible, serious conversation as never before. These intolerable acts all of a sudden main, made mainstream and legitimate any, any and all discussions about revolution. And it says, Governor Hutchinson was called to England and was replaced by General Thomas Gage, who brought an army of 4,000 men to quarter in Boston. Gage vowed severe discipline. The colonists vowed severe resistance. The die is cast, George III wrote to Lord North. The colonies must either triumph or submit. So who's controlling King George III? The author is suggesting the Jesuit general, Lorenzo Ricci. And, con and con consistent with the Jesuit oath, the Jesuits and their agents are working on both sides of the Atlantic to foment the Revolutionary War. That's what they do. They foment wars. They operate on both sides of the line. They manage the war to manipulate its outcome and then sit at the peace table to establish the terms of armistice. And in each case, this Hegelian dialectic system works for the quote-unquote greater glory of God, that little God in Rome in the little red shoes and the funky fish head hat. And he says, George, or excuse me, John Carroll left Wardour Castle in May of 1774 and sailed for Maryland to unite with his aged and widowed mother, the former Eleanor Darnell, whom he had not seen for 25 years. The history of Eleanor Darnell, uh, Darnall, excuse me, is the history of Maryland, which bears some reflection here. In 1625, at about the time young Charles Stuart was inheriting the throne of England from his father, King James I, the Jesuits converted a high government official to Roman Catholicism. That official was Secretary of State George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore. For the sake of appearances, it was deemed inappropriate for a Catholic to serve a Calvinist monarch. Baltimore resigned his post. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the Jesuits perfected an audacious marriage arrangement between Charles, now King Charles I, and a Roman Catholic princess, Henriette Marie, sister of Louis XIII of France. The marriage purported to be good for Charles's economic interests. He went out of his way to accommodate the Jesuits. Although a Scottish Calvinist, Charles conducted his monarchy in many respects as though it were Roman Catholic. He, sim he systematically weakened England's foreign policy towards Catholic France, the country of his queen. He promoted the highest levels in the Church of England, members of the High Church Party, clergyman sympathetic to Roman Catholic ritual and tradition. And he squandered England's resources in a pointless Jesuit-engineered war with Spain. Seven years into his marriage with Henriette Marie, Charles found himself stuck between personal indebtedness to Ignatian creditors and a, st and a stingy parliament. In hopes of generating tax revenues abroad, he carved a feudal barony out of 
northern Virginia and granted it to Lord Baltimore. But Baltimore died before developing the grant. The charter passed down to his son, Cecilius Calvert. Calvert, the new Lord Baltimore, called persecuted immigrants uh, uh, called persecuted immigrants desiring religious and tax freedom to participate in a voyage to a place bearing a name dear to Roman Catholics, Maryland, after the Blessed Virgin Mary. Baltimore did not neglect appealing to the the irreligious niche as well. A number of his advertisements spoke of the limitless opportunities for settling in Maryland, spelled M-E-R-R-I-E, land, to disguise that it was a Roman Catholic colony, obviously. And on November 22, 1633, two ships, the Ark and the Dove, set sail for London. Now, if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, you know that John Daniel was my guest last Friday, and he spoke of this, of a book that is written about the Ark and the Dove. And consistent with this research, it's going to be difficult, but I'm going to try to get a copy of that book and read it and and, and see if the thesis brought forward by Ep Tupper uh, Saucy is indeed supported by this book, The Ark and the Dove, that John Daniel spoke about so eloquently last Friday. And so... Uh, Anyway, continue with the reading. It says, On November 22, 1633, two ships, the Ark and the Dove, set sail for London. The passenger list included three Jesuits, 16 to 20 Roman Catholic gentlemen, several hundred predominantly Protestant slaves and laborers, and Cecilius Calvert's brother, Leonard. Leonard Calvert had been appointed Maryland's first governor. The voyage of the Ark and the Dove was spiritually directed by a Jesuit priest named Andrew White, educated at both St. Omer's and Douay, a professor for 20 years in Portugal, Spain, and Flanders. Andrew White is remembered by the Catholic Church as, quote, the apostle to Maryland, unquote. Choosing an Andrew for the task was good liturgical Kabbalah on the part of the Jesu, that is, the Church of Jesus, the, uh, the, the uh, headquarters of the Jesuit order. He said, Andrew, now that, uh, let me just add also, <laughs> the author is correctly linking Kabbalah with the Jesuits. They are not a Christian organization. They are a Freemasonic type organization. They believe in the esoteric teachings of of uh, the ancient Babylonian mystery schools, and uh, they pay Christ lip service to de- to to deceive the world. But they're not they're not agents of Christ. They're not ministers of Christ. They are a militia for the Pope, and the Pope is the modern day Nebuchadnezzar or the modern day Nimrod. It's not Christianity at all. Okay, repeating now, it says, Choosing an Andrew for the task was was good liturgical Kabbalah on the part of the Jesu, the Jesuits. Andrew was the brother of the Apostle Andrew and was the brother of the Apostle Peter, the first pope according to this author, which I can refute solidly. And it says, The rock upon whom Roman Catholicism claims to be established. Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland. King Charles I was a Scot. A personal representative of the king's brotherly attitude toward Rome could not be more eloquently identified than by the simple name Andrew. Andrew White consecrated the Maryland voyage to two Catholic saints, the Virgin Mary, protectress of the Jesuits, and Ignatius Loyola, only recently decreed patron saint of Maryland by Pope Urban VIII, the the second pupil of Jesuits to be elected pope. So there is indeed a great deal of uh, 
Kabbalah associated with this, and they even mar- uh, named the the Maryland College after Mary, who was also the patron of the Jesuit order, and uh, they they also uh, you know. Uh, dedicated the colonies to the founder of the Jesuit order, Ignatius Loyola. So uh, Maryland is a Roman Catholic colony with a purpose in this in the founding of this nation, and and the the author is going to develop this thesis. He says the ships were at sea for nearly four months, finally 123 days from England on March 25th, 16. The parties reached St. Clement's Island in the mouth of the Potomac River. It was an auspicious day. Not not only was March 25th the first of spring, but also it was the first day of the Julian calendar. More Kabbalah, I'll just add. It said in 1752 the colonies would adopt the Gregorian calendar, the Pope Gregory's Gregorian calendar, which we follow today. Uh, much to our demise, I might add. I'm beginning to contemplate and uh, comprehend. And on May, uh, on March 25th, Andrew White read the first Roman Catholic Mass ever held in any of the original 13 colonies. Now, this is a reiteration of the fact that Catholicism was equally suppressed in the colonies as it was in Great Britain. That's why Rome functioned so large in fomenting the revolution to see to it that religious liberty was predominant in this country so that Catholicism could flourish here, unlike Protestant Great Britain. And he says, Then he formally took possession of the land, quote, for our Savior and for our sovereign Lord King of England, unquote. Maryland historians traced the uh, the juridical origins of the Roman Catholic Church to a Patuxent Indian chief, Wigwam, which, which Andrew White denoted in his diary as, quote, the first chapel of Maryland, unquote. White introduced Roman Catholicism to the Patuxent, Anacostics, and the Piscataway Indians on real estate that today uh, comprises the District of Columbia. It's quite probable that the District of Columbia's executive mansion was termed White House less because of a color of exterior paint than out of reverence for the Apostle to Mary. Every, uh, excuse me, the Apostle to Maryland. Every utterance of White House should fill the historically knowledgeable Jesuit with pride in his society's achievements. Conversions among the Indians ran high, but the society enjoyed greater profits evangelizing Protestants. For every Protestant settler converted, the Jesuits won a land grant from Cecilius Calvert. Other lands Calvert retained and passed on to his descendants. Over the generations, Rock Creek Farm, with its Rome, on which the U.S. Capitol was erected, devolved to Calvert heiress Eleanor Darnall and her husband, an Irish immigrant whose marriage and abilities had earned enough money to make him a prosperous merchant planter. It it was uh, to this couple and on this land that the first American bishop was born in 1735. Now, the, the earlier reference he made to Rome, <clears throat> he may explain later, so I hope I'm not being redundant, but the land now claimed as the District of Columbia and, and, and the site of the capital proper uh, was a village called Rome. And it was owned by a man named Pope. And the tributary on the on the Potomac River on which it resided was known as the Tiber. It was regarded as the Tiber, Tiber Creek. So we'll see if he adds these details later in the text. He says, like his older brother Daniel, Jackie Carroll did his early schooling at Bohemian Manor, a secret Jesuit academy just down the road. Bohemia Manor had to be run secretly because the anti-Catholic was resulting from the the abdication of Catholic James II 
and the successor of Protestant William and Mary to the British throne in 1689. The penal period in Maryland, which would extend up to the, uh, the American Revolution, served the black papacy well by inclining affluent Catholic families to send their sons across the Atlantic to take the Jesuit Ratio Studiorum at St. Omer's. Indeed, more Americans went to St. Omer's College in the 18th century than to Oxford and Cambridge combined. We'll be back right after the messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening visit crosstheborder.org c r o s s crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America, 
in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about god's chosen people and so much more about bible prophecy this book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events get the book the rapture will be canceled visit crosstheborder.org c-r-o-s-s crosstheborder.org to get your print epub or pdf version of the book the rapture will be canceled that's crosstheborder.org Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support Inquisition Update and keep this broadcast on the air, please support First Amendment Radio, who pays the bills. Now, let's continue with the book, Rulers of Evil, by F. Tupper Saucy. And we're talking about the Jesuit boys, or the, the, uh, the Carroll boys, being shipped off to their uh, Jesuit university in uh, St. Omer's via the uh, Bohemian Manor that was established in the Maryland colonies uh, to send these boys away to get a thoroughly Jesuit education. And it says, at the tender age of 13, Jackie sailed to Europe with his even younger cousin, Charles Carroll, <clears throat> Charles Carroll, for schooling at St. Omer's. Daniel returned home from there to help manage the family interest, interests he stood to inherit. In 1753, Jackie entered the novitiate uh, of the, the Jesuits at Watton in the Netherlands. Charles went on to study pre-law at Voltaire's alma mater, the College of Louis le Grand, in Paris. In 1758, Jackie returned to St. Omer's to teach, while Charles crossed the Channel to England, enrolling in London's premier school of barristers, the Inner Temple, founded in the 14th century by the Knights Templar. Jackie was, edu uh, excuse me, Jackie was ordained to the Jesuit priesthood in 1761. When he, uh, when he learned that St. Omer's was about to be seized by the French government in preparation for the royal edict suppressing the Jesuits in France, remember this took place in 1773, he, with other teachers and their pupils, moved to Bruges. In 1769, he renounced his Calvert inheritance, sloughed off his nickname, took the extreme Jesuit vow of papal obedience, and began teaching philosophy and theology at the English College in Liege. It was here that he befriended Charles Philippe Stourton, his grand tour companion that we talked about in the previous chapter. John Carroll's arrival at his mother's home in Maryland uh, coincided with Paul Revere's ride to Philadelphia bearing letters from the Boston Committee of Correspondence seeking aid from Charles Thompson's group in protesting the closing of Boston Harbor. From his mother's estate at Rock Creek, Carl dealt with the aftermath of the Tea Act by exercising his quote-unquote secularized priestly authority as prefect of the sodality. In other words, he controlling the Roman Catholic laymen in organizations of, of uh, political operations. And uh, when we get to the book, and I intend to read that book, on this on this program when we get to pd stewart's book we'll learn more about the roman catholic sodalities it'll 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 wake you up that's for certain he says he integrated the catholics of maryland pennsylvania and northern virginia into the movement for independence so why would the catholics be interested in moving for independence so that they could have religious freedom in this country have you ever heard this thesis talked about before? I never have. I mean, this book is an eye-opener for me. I've always heard the, for, the, the, the formation of this country as a Protestant endeavor. 
so that the Protestants could come to this country and not have to deal with the Inquisition and the, and the persecution of the Roman Catholic Church. But I always failed to understand that Roman Catholicism was suppressed in Great Britain, and there were uh, many numbers of Roman Catholics who wanted to come to this country to have religious liberty. So literally, we just brought the, 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 the controversy that was age-old in England and Europe to this country. And I've been blinded to one half of this Hegelian dialectic that's operating in this country. Not many years ago, if I began to comprehend what this is really all about. He says, Charles Thompson... Now, and before we continue on, I want to make sure my listeners understand something. <clears throat> By reading this book and studying this book, it is not my purpose to suggest that the Vatican or the Jesuits or Catholicism has any legitimate claim to this country. On this basis, I make that statement, that the Pope has no legitimate authority in the world. Okay, I know who my Lord and Savior is. I know who the lawgiver is, and I know in whom my hope lies. And for my purposes, this is a Protestant nation. It's a Protestant constitution, and it's a Protestant bill of rights. I enjoy my Protestant liberties in this country, and I do not lend credence or legitimacy to any Vatican claim to this country. I reject that, that, that the Pope had any legitimate right to send Christopher Columbus to the West to claim all lands for the Pope, because the Pope has no legitimate authority in the world. And I denounce Christopher Columbus for the atrocities that he committed when he came to the Western Hemisphere, burning Indians, baptizing them and hanging them and burning them. I mean, he, he, was, I mean, he, was, he was a typical Roman Catholic. Heretics are to be burned at the stake. And, and I lend no credence even to the fact that the Jesuits, the Jesuit explorers that came to this country early before its founding and set up Jesuit missions all throughout the country and established trade routes and began to research and to Catholicize the Indian populations of this country, I deny that that gives them any legitimate right to claim this land for the Pope. The world is the... Thereof. The Pope is a pretender. People give him the power and order to rule the world, but I don't. And because I'm in this country, from a Catholic point of view, they believe of the right, the divine right, to not only rule this country but the entire world, and that's the new world order. So if there are any critics out there who are stewing about me reading and studying and understand the history of the fomentation of the division between Protestant Great Britain and the colonies for the sake of legitimizing some Roman Catholic claim, you're wrong. It's not my purpose to legitimize the Pope at all, nor to legitimize Catholicism at all. It is that prophesied Antichrist beast system as described in the Bible. And it's a counterfeit that has deceived the whole world. And for many years it deceived me, but my eyes are open and are being opened more and more every day. So don't take this reading and studying of this book as any endorsement of, of the Vatican's right to rule anything. I deny him the right to even rule Vatican City. Vatican City is a pretension in itself. And the Pope is an imposter. He's not the vicar of Christ. I don't want to legitimize the Vatican's claim to this country, nor their claim that they should be able to rule this country by divine right, or that they should be the lawgiver in this country and to enslave the American people. And that will be the subject of our talk tomorrow with Nicholas Arthur. The enslavement of the American people to this government that we always be regarded as Protestant, but who has a, a, a controlling Catholic 
influence, the purpose of which is to enslave us all and to make us chattel of the Pope. And uh, so this study, in my opinion, and, and rulers of evil is legitimate, at least to understand Rome's attitude in this country. Now, let me see if I can remember where I was here before I uh, went off here. Okay. Charles Thompson's Philadelphia committee sent Boston a letter of support. The committee additionally proposed a Congress of Deputies for the colonies to A, consider measures to restore harmony with Great Britain, and B, to prevent the dispute from advancing to an undesirable end. Thompson then notified all the, uh, the, the colonies south of Phil, uh, Pennsylvania of his committee's actions. He suggested the necessity of calling a general congress to consider the problem. Combined with a similar call from the Virginia House of Burgesses, his suggestion was approved throughout the colonies. Plans were laid for the first Continental Congress to meet at Philadelphia in September. On June 1st of 1774, the bill closing Boston Harbor went into effect. Thompson's radicals led Philadelphia in observing a day of mourning. Shops closed. Churches, churches held services. The people remained quietly in their homes. June 8th, Thompson and more than 900 freeholders petitioned Governor Richard Penn to convene the Pennsylvania Assembly so that it might consider sending delegates on an all-colony Congress to explore ways of restoring harmony and peace to the British Empire. The governor refused their request and justified Thompson's taking action outside the established order. Thompson called for a town meeting to be held on June 18th nearly and he says nearly 8,000 Philadelphians attended. Boisterously, they resolved that the closing of Boston Harbor was tyrannical and that the Continental Congress was secure, uh, to secure the rights and liberties of the colonies must be convened at Philadelphia. In July, the Pennsylvania Assembly yielded to Thompson's popular pressure and agreed to name a delegation to, his, to this first Continental Congress. Thompson, however, was not named. Interesting. Thanks to the publicity of the first citizen, second citizen media production during the first half of 1773, Charles Carroll was named by the Annapolis Committee of Correspondence to be a delegate to the First Continental Congress, but he declined the nomination. He said that his usefulness might might be restricted by the anti-Catholic settlement sentiment engendered by the Quebec Act, with which Parliament had avenged the Boston Tea Party by giving the western lands of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Virginia, and New York to Catholic Quebec. He attended the Congress, however, but as an unofficial consultant to the Marylanders. Charles Thompson accompanied the Pennsylvanians in the same capacity to prepare for the September 5th opening session, delegates began arriving in Philadelphia in late August. They congregated at a well-known radical meeting place, the elegant, the elegant mansion of Thomas Mulfin. Excuse me, Thomas Mulfin. Mifflin was uh, study, uh, had studied classics under Charles Thompson at Benjamin Franklin's Academy, later to become the University of Pennsylvania. They were close friends. As Milton's house guest, Thompson was on hand round the clock to greet and confer with the arriving leaders, most of whom already knew him by name. John Adams' uh, diary, excuse me, John Adams' diary entry for August 30th speaks of, quote-unquote, much conversation he and his fellow delegates had with the learned Thompson. He called Thompson, quote, the Sam Adams of Philadelphia and life of the cause of, of liberty. And he says, Thompson and the Carrolls, Charles, Daniel, and John, spent these critical 
preliminary days lobbying for the inevitability of war. Thompson was already heavily invested in New Jersey's Batso furnace. He says uh, Batso would furnish cannonballs, cannon shot, kettles, spikes, and nails to the army through the War Commission, who controlled all the executive duties of the military department. There's the beginning of our military and industrial complex. It says the war commissioner was just the man Lorenzo Ritchie needed for the job, Charles Carroll. Now, the, the, the Carroll involvement has been largely ignored, in my opinion, by the researchers into this subject. At least... John Daniel and and F. Tupper Saucy make a powerful argument that it is not wise for us to ignore the influence of the Carroll family into the founding of this nation. He says Thompson was elected Secretary of the First Continental Congress, an office he held under the title Perpetual Secretary until the United States Constitution was ratified in 1789, led the delegates through an, uh, an itemized statement of the American theory of reb uh, rebellion that culminated in the critical declaration and resolves of October 14, 1774. It was while the First Continental Congress was deliberating America's future under British tyranny that Ganganelli, Pope Clement XIV, died his agonizing death, September 22nd, 1774. Now, remember, researcher uh, 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 Eric John Phelps says that Ganganelli suppressed the Jesuits through a papal bull, Dominus Act Redemptor Noster, and he was subsequently poisoned by the Jesuits, and he died an agonizing death. He was given a lethal dose of Aketa, which any dose of Aketa is lethal, the only thing to be determined is how long you suffer and die before it finally kills you. That, that is adjusted by the dose. So he was given a, a minor dose of, of, of a keta and then slowly, painfully died as a result of the, the suppression of the Jesuits, or at least that's what we're told. <laughs> and it says, when the papacy is vacant, says the New Catholic Encyclopedia, the administration and guardianship of the Holy See's temporal rights, that is, its business affairs, are routinely taken over by the treasurer of the apostolic chamber. The apostolic treasurer on the day of Ganganelli's passing was Cardinal Giovanni Braschi, a 57-year-old aristocrat of impoverished parentage. <laughs> Cardinal... Cardinal Braschi was a sterling product of the Jesuit colleges. The Ratio Studiorum had him, uh, excuse me, had made of him a distinguished lawyer and diplomat. He had an apostolic treasurer when Rothschild began serving the apostolic principality of Hess Hanover in 1769. So now we're, we're, we're here, we're talking about the Rothschilds now becoming the, 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 uh, the guardians of the Vatican treasury. It says, This interesting fact awakens the possibility that the Cardinal and Rothschilds had been involved in Ritchie's American project for years. Okay, more evidence to support the theory that the Carrolls, particularly John, who went throughout Europe, was indeed gathering up finances to, to foment this, this revolutionary war. And it says, but that is only conjecture, says, says uh, F. Tupper Saucy. He says, what is beyond conjecture, however, is that until a new pope could be elected, the whole fiscal wealth of the Roman Catholic Church belonged to Braschi and no one else. Although lacking formal entitlement, Cardinal Braschi would rule as a kind of virtual Pontifex Maximus for one of the longest periods of papal vacancy on record. Day after day after day, the conclave haggled over a single issue. What would the candidates do about the Jesuits? Should Ganganelli's brief disestablishment continue to be enforced or not? 
although Judge General Lorenzo Ritchie was in detention at Castle St. Angelo, we know he could easily, easily hop a tunnel carriage to the Vatican for covert meetings with the virtual Pope. It says, in every real way, Brasci was a creation of Lorenzo Ricci. Brasci had been made a cardinal under the sponsorship of Ganganelli, Pope Clement XIV, whose own cardinalate was sponsored, as we recall, by Lorenzo Ricci, the Jesuit general. These two most powerful men on earth, Lorenzo Ricci and Brasci, have been secretly allied for years, and now the turn of events has made them invisible and inaudible. These last precious days in the final bursting forth of Ritchie's grand strategy afforded ideal conditions for Brasci and Ritchie to determine face-to-face -face with the Rothschild emissaries, out of public sight and out of public mind, how the Vatican's immense resources, money, men, and supplies would be deployed in coming months and years. In October of 1774, for example, colonial agent Benjamin Franklin sent England's most enlightened copywriter, Tom Paine, to beef up the pamphleteers in Philadelphia. The days of papal vacancy wore on. 30, 50, 60, 75, and 100 days, 110 Finally, after nearly five months of confusion, <clears throat> on February 15, 1775, the 134 days, it was announced that Rome had a new pope. The new pope was a man acceptable to both sides of the Jesuit question. He had tacitly assured the anti-Jesuits that he would continue to enforce the disestablishment, yet to the pro-Jesuits, Knew he, uh, yet the pro-Jesuits knew he would enforce it tenderly because of the great intellectual, political, and spiritual debts he owed to the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order. The new pope was best qualified for the papacy because he'd been running the Holy See with Lorenzo Ricci for the past 134 days. Giovanni Brasci. Brasci took the papal name Pius VI and now plummeted the great avalanche. The avalanche of boulders that Lorenzo Ricci had strategically placed on precarious positions to roll all at once to throw Great Britain and the colonies into a revolutionary war. And he says, on February 9, 1775, the British Parliament declared Massachusetts to be, quote, in a state of rebellion, unquote. On March 23rd, Patrick Henry delivered his famous Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death oration. And on April 19th, at a tense daybreak confrontation on Lexington Green between a group of angry colonists and some 800 redcoats, an unseen and unidentified shooter fired on the redcoats from behind a nearby meeting house. This was the shot heard round the world. All Ralph Waldo Emerson coined the phrase in his Concord, his Concord hymn of 1836 to describe a skirmish at Concord Bridge seven miles away and a few hours later. The air on Lexington Green crackled with the exploding, with exploding gunpowder. Excuse me. The air on Lexington Green crackled with exploding gunpowder, and when the smoke cleared, eight colonists lay dead. As the Redcoats returned to Boston, they were attacked by ever-increasing colonial militiamen. The Massachusetts Pro uh, Provincial Congress mobilized 13,600 colonial soldiers and placed Boston under a siege that lasted for a year. To prevent the spread of the Boston carnage to the Quaker province, the Pennsylvania Assembly named Charles Thompson and 12 others to the committee to purchase explosives and munitions. And while I've run out of time, we'll return to this tomorrow on the broadcast. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stay tuned for more godly teaching on First Amendment Radio. I'll see you tomorrow.
Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.